Okay, welcome everyone. So on behalf of the Quantum BC uh, Scholars, oh, sorry, the, the seminar committee, I welcome you to come to our new Quantum BC seminar series. So this is a seminar series that we aim to bring all the quantum uh, researchers in BC area in both SFU, UBC, and UBIC together and share our research results and facilitate discussion among us. And hopefully we will start some um, collaboration. So, um, and I, especially in SFU side, this is the place that's not only to read the, uh, watch the uh, uh, um, seminars, but also bring everyone together to have discussion. So therefore in order to facilitate discussion, I prepare some lubricant, which is some um, black and in liquid state, which is a coffee. So uh, in the remaining of the, um, uh, uh, this term, the physics department will be probably serving a coffee. So please come to our seminar to have, watch a great shows and also um, enjoy some discussions. So um, our today's speaker is our Professor Stephanie Siemens. So um, from the Department of Physics in the S SFU. So Steph has uh, many shiny titles, uh, including she is the um, Canada Research Chair, CIFA um, Quantum Information Science Fellow, and very recently a co-chair of the National Quantum Strategy um, Advisory Council. And uh, of course, uh, she has recently started a very exciting company called Photonic E, and she is serving as the um, chief quantum officer in the company. And Seth has uh, a group is working on second quantum technologies. And in the past few years, uh, she is making breakthroughs and breakthroughs in this kind of platform, which makes it extremely promising. And in particular, her work in 2013 and 2015 has been uh, uh, nominated as a physics world top 10 breakthroughs of the years. So I'm assuming that she will make more and more breakthroughs in the coming year. So we're waiting to see. And then um, she also awards the, the Canada's top 40 under 40 in um, 2020. And has, her work is well uh, uh, um, broadcast on many news websites such as uh, um, New York Times, CBC, and BBC. So today, I think she will um, tell us more about the new um, results in the Silicon um, Color Centers. So Steph, welcome, and thank you for giving out uh, your talk. Well, thank you, and thank you very much for your interest. So yes, um, I do wear many, many hats, and uh, I'm going to be uh, speaking to you from uh, my with my SFU hat on. So yes, um, uh, we have a we have a startup that is commercializing these uh, these technologies, and I'm not going to be at liberty to share with you what the the company's um, working on. However, I will uh, spend the first part of this conversation motivating silicon color centers because I think it's important to get the message out about just how transformative something like this could be in the race towards uh, large scale useful quantum technologies. So uh, from that you can read into what you want because it's kind of more of a, a broader motivation and kind of points a little bit to, to why uh, we're, we're hitting the go button so hard on this one. But yeah, the photonic is, is not what we're going to be talking about today. What I'm going to open up with is um, something that uh, is kind of working backwards, right? So I got started in this quantum space a long time ago, and uh, it was clear then and remains clear now that we're going to need to have buckets of qubits, like just lots and lots and lots of really high performing qubits. And I want to maybe just set the stage in terms of where this race is, because if we want to, the reason why we need to have lots of qubits is because for even the best code, quantum uh, error correction codes that exist, you need to have a certain number of physical qubits be, be one logical qubit. And when I mean logical qubit, and I'm assuming not everybody here is, they're at different stages in their career perhaps, a logical qubit is effectively a qubit you can trust or has an error rate that um, allows you to run these algorithms that have fantastic known applications, right? So we talk about um, chemistry applications, of course, chemical simulations underpin a lot of, of modern society in many different sectors. Um, there's an exponential speed ups on certain integer programming problems related to logistics or combinatorial optimization. And of course, the famous Shores algorithm, which is going to be a rather disruptive event unless we kind of get going and, and uh, change, change the way we think about communications and cryptography in that sense. But let's just like wind back, right? So we have all these wonderful use cases that we know are going to be unlocked with fault tolerant quantum computing or, or logical quantum computing. And we are, we're going to have, regardless of the code that we use, 
we're going to have to put lots of qubits down to make that happen. So if you use the surface code, which is, um, I would say, the dominant uh, structure for quantum error correction, and we'll speak more about that later, the overheads you need are phenomenal. It's something like upwards of 3,000, upwards to maybe 10,000 physical qubits for one logical qubit, depending upon details. This, this is, um, you know, huge because right now the world record is in the, you know, few hundred region and there's not very many that are playing up in that, in that space. So, and the reason, one of the reasons why there, there's this big gap is um, it gets that the systems engineering of these systems is actually almost a bigger challenge than the physics, I would argue. In that, if you go and take a look at the different kinds of platforms out there, and I just threw a few here, there's there's kind of a natural scale to the, the system, the box that you can put these things in past which, not that it's impossible to put another qubit, but it would just be easier if one could make a second copy of said box and then link them together. So what I mean by that is like a distributed framework. If you can actually put, you know, if you really do need 20 million qubits and it's really hard to get more than about a thousand into each one of these boxes, maybe it's a lot easier to have lots of boxes. So this is the, the, the pitch to a, a distributed quantum framework. And this is how supercomputing works today, by the way. Um, instead of having a monolithic uh, classical supercomputer, they actually just have a bunch of you know, there's huge rooms full of individual uh, servers, right, that are all working together. And so you can imagine a, a similar uh, winning criteria for, for quantum. Now, okay, um, let's work backwards from that. What does that mean, right? So if you're going to have that, you're going to want to have connections between these boxes to make this all work. And I'm not the first to make that observation, right? Like there's lots of ways of connecting these quantum systems together. And if you're going to be connecting different boxes together, although it is possible to connect them with microwave photons, it's far, far better to connect it with telecom photons if you can, because A, that's um, bigger than the, the um, thermal energy and room temperature, so it's a lot easier to trust them as individual qubits um, for lots of reasons we can get into. But also, it is also true that the quantum internet of the future will be a telecom network. Like I just, I don't see a possible, from an engineering and a commercial argument, any other conclusion, right? So it might, it's technically possible, but I think it's gonna be overwhelmingly, the incentives are to make this a, a telecom network. So, okay, so let's imagine a distributed framework connected via telecom um, fibers. If that's the case, we can connect these things any way we want, okay? And this sounds like a very small observation, but it's massive. It's in fact, they think the observation that's been missing in the quantum field for mm, 20 years. Because as soon as you allow for any connectivity you want, you change the goalposts. And I'll, I'll walk you through that. Um, so we'll, we'll speak to that in a second, but let's just imagine the, the, the comment. If we have a distributed framework, right? And we have, we have the opportunity to think about connectivity in a really flexible way that essentially unlocks new error correcting codes and it makes everything faster. And I'll talk about that in a bit. But why am I saying all this? It's, it's trying to kind of work backwards from success. What does that mean for the physical system that you would need to maximize uh, the performance, the quantum performance in a distributed quantum network of computers, right? You're going to have to have a really good telecom interface for one, um, but you're also going to have to have lots of them. So let's work that through. Imagine you have a logical qubit made up of seven physical qubits. So let's say you're working with a system that's so high performance that, that you have you know, just that really, really low overhead from an error correction perspective. How many photonic links would you need for that system to perform well, right? So say these are two different boxes that have, to have seven physical qubits in, in each of them. You could have one physical, one link, one, one ability to transduce its information to a telecom photon on the edge of those boxes, say, right? And if you did that, what would it mean for a logical operation between those two logical qubits, right? It would be a massive slowdown because if you take a look at how you would implement a logical operation between those two blocks, you actually need pairwise uh, physical operations between each of those qubits. And if all of those are being generated through a photonic link that's bottlenecked at one edge of your, of your box, that's gonna be a massive serial slowdown that you don't need. 
So this actually motivates the idea of having a photonic link connected to all of your physical qubits so that you can have effective logical operations in this distributed um, framework. So this went really technical, all right? So forgive me for launching into something um, this deep. It's really not specific to our architecture, other than to say, I think that photonic links are incredibly important for anything quantum at scale, not just a quantum network and quantum repeaters, which I didn't get to, but just distributed quantum computing full stop, which I think we're going to need to be able to hit these, these larger, large scale problems, right, that we all really want to unlock in a fault tolerant regime. So I think color centers and particularly telecom color centers have a unique place in, in the future of, of quantum technologies. And if it's not color centers, it's some equivalent, right? Something that has a really easy link to, to a, a telecom photon. So here's a wall of text that I'll, I'll just kind of break down for you. This is the, this is the thing that we've been missing and getting back to connectivity, okay? And again, if you don't have this as your background and you're just kind of get, getting into quantum information, because I know there's a mixed audience here, I'll break this down for you. Basically, if you're working with old uh, planar codes for quantum error correction, they don't compete well um, against some of these beautiful new, like there's just been breakthrough after breakthrough in quantum error correction over the past two years in particular, three years, that have, I think, gone underappreciated by the community at large. And this is, again, perhaps part of the issue with the way quantum technologies are being developed. They're all, and all those communities are up and down the stack are very siloed. We're not talking to each other as much as I think we should be. So the air correction, like it's completely changed the, the challenge. And this is not something that people are openly talking about. And so if anything, you know, before I get to talk about how great some of the science that we've been working on is, I just wanted to bring to your attention, like, hey, this is amazing. Like we should just be all thinking about this. If we really are motivated to deliver useful quantum technologies, we should be thinking about how to develop and co-design for these codes that are just amazing. So let me walk through some of the details here, just at a really high level. The, old, the codes that I have on the left here are complainer codes. They are amazing under the assumption that the way that you link your qubits is through nearest neighbor interactions, okay? And that's true for a lot of systems. A lot of systems, the way that you get two qubit gates is through proximity, right? Some kind of overlap to some level. And if you have that restriction in terms of the way you think about um, your operations, you're basically provably optimal or near optimal if you use something like the surface code. Okay, and there's there's variations to it, but you can you're kind of um, near the best you could hope for if you're worth with these kind of planar codes. And those codes do leave something to be desired in the sense that these overheads aren't just bad, but they get worse the bigger you go, right? So that's called a vanishing rate. So the code rate R there, it means it goes down the bigger the system you want to um, uh, encode. Now, the thresholds there, which is like how much error you could really tolerate is about 10%. And so this is kind of why people have been going for these codes, because they're, they're, the encoding rates aren't perfect, but the, the thresholds are, are good, but the overheads are just um, something that we had to brace ourselves for. These other codes, which is kind of a broader category of codes, they're called QLDPC codes. They're kind of the quantum version of 5G codes. So the LDPC is a known category of codes for 5G networks. You can make them quantum, as it were. And there have been examples, that's a broad category, okay? But there have been examples in that category that are basically as good a code as you could hope for right, in terms of the encoding rate. So instead of talking about 10,000 physical qubits for one logical, we're talking about a ratio of 20 to one, okay? And not just a 20 to one, they have a whole bunch of other perks, like you can do single shot extraction, they have excellent decoders and similar thresholds and similar weight check. Like, so basically for everything where they're equivalent, they're at least equivalent to the planar uh, codes or way better, right? So again, this is a broad category, so I can't say these things are, are different categorically, but they're just the opportunities there are so substantial that it would be crazy not to be devoting a lot more resources into not just developing these codes, but developing the architectures that can best implement these codes. And so you could forgive yourself for not knowing about them, if you haven't heard about these before, because there's a very asymmetric balance in terms of who's doing what in these codes, although it is starting to change. 
the surface code is seen like 60x what you can uh, what you're seeing in terms of work and effort compared to these LWPC codes. But I do think that it is one of these these tipping points in a in the history of a technology to go from something where the overheads are 10,000 to one to 20 to one, right? Because then you can meaningfully take a look at these 400, 500, thousand qubit systems that are on the on the near term horizon and think about implementing logical qubits within those those frames, right? Which is something you can't really do um, in, in these old kind of older architectures. So this is allowing you to think, okay, if the box size is really a thousand or 10,000 qubits and you can't even get one logical qubit out of that, how are we going to this this new approach allows you to take a look at, at scaling in a bit different way. So this is all to say um, that's kind of a preface as a motivation to why we are particularly keen on color centers. And there's uh, so we're very motivated by the fact that these have native telecom links, um, that they have the memory to enable not just the computing, um, but also the long distance networking, because you're going to want to plug into some kind of telecom. And underpinning all of it is, is silicon. So um, I'm very happy to uh, share with you some of the work that we've been doing on the elements that we think have, have uh, this, uh, that can plug into these, these larger distributed networks. When we went looking, actually, there wasn't really many other um, teams in this space, if any. Uh, so I started up at Simon Fraser University in 2015 based upon these axioms, right? Essentially going to take a look for something that wasn't just silicon or something that was just telecom. I felt like you needed to have all three of these things. So not just a pure photonics play where you're using telecom photons because you do really benefit from memory in many different ways. And again, not just a silicon spin only approach, which did set fantastic performance metrics over the years. And I was very fortunate to contribute to some of those but really missing that telecom link to get off the chip and think about linking lots of these, these uh, modules together. So we went looking for essentially this ingredient and the, the closest sister technology for those of you who aren't familiar with the space would be NV centers in Diamond. The difference being, I think silicon is really important for this because silicon is not just the um, a phenomenal quantum environment to hit all these records and all that stuff. But it's also, from a commercial perspective, where you want to be if you're going to do integrated electronics and integrated photonics. So this ties back to the telecom approach, right? If you're going to be working with telecom photons, you want to have an integrated approach to that at scale. And silicon is, is the name of the game there, although there, you could consider technically other platforms. So just a, a few words, and perhaps this audience isn't, uh, does not need a uh, detailed briefing on this, but if you were to think about the components necessary to integrate photonics at scale, certainly from the passive perspective, passive components like beam splitters and uh, the rest, you can do very well in silicon. Um, and a lot of the pioneering work, you know, one of the reasons I, I got started here in, in the Lower Mainland is because there's a rich history of integrated silicon photonics within this area that has been really, it's again, standing on the shoulders of giants. There's been decades of development to take essentially a full optical table and scrunch it down using the high index of refraction of silicon to basically print the components you want using standard fabrication capabilities into a silicon wafer. So it's a slightly modified version of, of the standard silicon wafers that you use in the supercomputers in your pocket. It's an SOI framework where you have a device layer, a single crystal device layer on top of a buried oxide, which is a low index of refraction. So the guided mode sits right, right in the middle. And the picture here is that for a silicon color center, what you want is not just an efficient, um, uh, connection to telecom photons. You have to collect most of them. So what we wanted was a color center, which, which I mean um, a defect, essentially a crystal defect, that you could put bang in the middle of the mode of this, of this integrated photonics platform. And this compares favorably to an alternative um, but nearly equivalent approach where you would have, say, for example, an ion trap on top of an integrated photonics platform that couples in evanescently. Right, so the point is you put it right in the mode so you can collect most of the light and then you could put whatever components you need to collect and guide the light and condition it to to your satisfaction. So that's the picture that's how you can then talk to it, you can use photons to talk to it using this guided light and, and collect. So I mentioned um, silicon has been uh, featuring prominently prominently in the development of quantum technologies, certainly in terms of the individual qubit metrics. 
And I just wanted to flag that, you know, SFU has been in this game for a little while, little old SFU, right? Um, so one of the beautiful things that was, uh, uh, one of the most beautiful things ever made has been this Avogadro crystal you can see on the left. And this was actually used to redefine the kilogram. So now, if you were to measure yourself, it actually is against, in a formal sense, um, measured against a number of silicon 28 atoms. And, and that was done through this Avogadro project. And the reason why it's silicon 28 is they, they wanted to reduce the isotopic variation within the crystal because the, the silicon 29s, by virtue of being odd um, numbered, has an odd number, uh, has a, a, a nuclear spin to it. And so that they wanted to purify it all the way. But one of the consequences of that is that that material is a fantastic quantum material because it reduces, it removes that um, source of magnetic noise because those nuclear spins, even if only at 5%, um, are, are a source of very weak magnetic noise. And it's the reason why group four is so popular. So diamond, silicon carbide and silicon is that you can isotopically purify the host and make it essentially a magnetic vacuum as it were. Or like it's, it's really very similar to a vacuum in the sense that it's, it's stuck there and there's no noise around it, but now, you don't have to have all the vacuum electronics. You could just use silicon. Now, as soon as you get rid of that noise, you have these phenomenally long lifetimes. And uh, the only record that I, I don't really want to beat that record, but it's a similar kind of color center um, that Matt Sellers beat us by a factor of two um, uh, the year after. But there's two axes here and both matter. So the one on the left, or sorry, the, the y-axis that you care about here is, is the number of operations that you can do before the spin decoheres. And that actually is related to the error correction uh, I was telling you about. That's a native error rate. These things slowly die over time. And if you have something that's you can do with um, that you can implement many, many operations within that coherence time, that means your native error rate is really, really low. And you have a good chance with developing the controls of your system to hit better and better error correction overheads. But the, the x-axis matters too, if you think about these things in the context of um, uh, repeaters and telecom networks and the rest, because you care about time of flight, right? So the fact that it hits uh, three hour coherence times is, is also competitive from a networking perspective where you're going to be thinking about using memories to, to really distribute entanglement at scale. Now, the, the defects that I uh, worked on for some of those results do have uh, optical access, but not exactly what you want. And perhaps this is why nobody went looking in silicon to find this magic ingredient that we've, we've been able to unlock. These, uh, these are phosphorus defects, which are um, just substitutional defects. You take one of those silicon atoms and you replace it with a phosphorus atom instead. Very common dopant that's used in all of CMOS processing for microelectronics. Um, these things actually do emit light just so infrequently that they're not really feasible. Put another way, um, the, their interaction with the light field is so low that you can't imagine doing these kinds of, of networking applications, even if it is a near infrared emitter. So what we went is we looked at what was out there and we started looking at different wavelength regions and just the primary uh, motivation was to find something that was silicon integrated. And I just wanted to flag that there are other bodies of work that um, came before. Uh, so some of the erbium, there's a few pieces of erbium work because you can, erbium is a, is a defect that, or so it's an atom, but it has an inner shell transition, which is um, uh, almost always available depending upon what material it's in. And that is rayed at a telecom wavelength. And so you'd think, okay, this looks really, really promising. The problem is, is that they are, uh, they emit very, very slowly or so infrequently that it's similar to the problem that I described on the previous slide. So what we went in is we just started looking at a whole bunch of different stuff. And what we found was a world of options, actually. So we were very lucky to kind of go into this space before people had really played around in it because we were able to go and dig up all this old literature of all this stuff that people have been looking at in silicon to see what could possibly fit the, the premise of good qubit performance, right? Good memory um, and fidelities and telecom and ideally native to silicon, something easy to make. We found a whole category of stuff called radiation damage centers. So this is like a body of literature where they would take silicon and send it into space and see what kind of damage it would get because they wanted silicon to work in space. And when it would come back, they would characterize it and take a look at what the naturally forming defects were and they actually just would label them according to the alphabet suit because they wouldn't know what they were. They would just emit light, right? And so they would see, um, you know, what's called a zero phonon line, which is the characteristic wavelength of a particular emitter. 
And then they would take a look at its its uh, sideband and its vibration levels and kind of tease out what makes that defect. What what is the isotopic constituents? What's its um, uh, how is it actually uh, aligned and how is it uh, what's the structure of that defect? And there's a whole whole bunch of literature and not everything worked, but we found something that looks really, really good. We found a few. So what we did is we took our beautiful silicon 28 and we damaged it and saw what came out naturally. And so we have, uh, and now there's research groups, actually, there's a research group working on C and separately on G and separately on W, because each of these are actually good emitters. And so that's the other um, aspect to this is that for those of us in the field that care just about the photon degree of freedom, you can imagine having just the ability to create light in silicon easily through an electrically pumped source or otherwise, that would be still something of value. So there's a lot of interest in, in just getting emitters, not necessarily attached to a, a quantum memory. And that's what these are. So that's the punchline for these three. Um, the rest of the talk is going to be talking about the T-Center, which also has, has memory. But these ones are interesting in their own right. So there's been a body of work that's come out taking a look at the T-Center, which is an oxygen-hydrogen uh, complex. The G-Center, which honestly forms so naturally, it's almost hard to scrub out of your system. And, and the silicon tetra interstitial, which is called a W center. So we took a look at that. That's some of our early work. Um, and it opened up the world of opportunities to us to take a look at these, these other complexes. This is what I'm going to be spending the rest of the talk talking about. This is what I think is really going to unlock a lot um, in terms of the direction that I was setting out at the beginning. This is called the T center. And if and if you'll forgive me, I'll take the next 15 minutes or so just to kind of walk through. Uh, academically where where we're at with this um, with this defect and maybe what you want to know about it. What's special about this one compared to the three that I just talked about is it has an unpaired electron spin. Now electron spins are way more sensitive to the magnetic field than the nuclear spin, so much so that if you apply a magnetic field, you can actually send a different optical wavelength to talk to the different spin states. And that allows for really easy initialization, even manipulation to, to a low fidelity level and potentially high fidelity and measurement. So you can do a lot of uh, good, you can play with the spin a lot using just optics. You can also use these spins and, and uh, manipulate them using traditional magnetic resonance, which has gone and set these records of, of however many nines um, for uh, initialization, manipulation and measurement simultaneously. Um, as well as long lifetimes. So, so that's the other thing I wanted to mention is that the spins in silicon, usually the lifetimes of the spins in silicon is much more to do with the silicon and the other uh, dirt or, or lack thereof in the silicon rather than the defect itself, right? So it's to do with like the quality of your magnetic vacuum essentially rather than the, the quality of the defect. So, because they have very similar wave functions. So this is, this is it. It means you, um, the T-center itself, two carbons, and a hydrogen and an unpaired electron. So technically four qubits in each of these in each of these centers. You can implant uh, carbon 13 so that each of them have a nuclear spin, um, or you can implant carbon 12, which have a spin nuclear spin zero, and then just play with an, uh, the two spins at the time. It emits right in the O band, so 1326 nanometers, which is actually really nice when you think about um, the dispersion curve of the world's most important single mode fiber. Um, so SMF 28, the, the zero dispersion point for that is right near uh, 1325. So that allows for a uh, very good long distance networking of, of these signals without any dispersion effects. Now, um, and that is the dominant mode fiber for all of data centers as well, right? So if you're thinking about plugging this in there, you already have that natural advantage. So it has a sideband. Um, it has, so when, when we went and looked at this, all right, let me just wind back. So when we first found this thing, um, it hadn't been characterized as a qubit like, at all, right? It wasn't even known if that had an unpaired electron spin in the ground state. For so, so for those of you who haven't been um, watching our history, we, the first few years was actually just figuring out, is this thing any good? And the answer is that it is really good. Um, it maybe I could, you know, if I could have my way, I would maybe tweak a few parameters, a few, uh, ways here or there, but essentially it's it's kind of a Goldilocks zone. And it is one of a category of, of defects that fit into this bill. So the TIM, and there's like a handful of others that have this property, the T-Center is just as our favorite for a few different reasons. But we went and characterized it. And uh, there's like a giant mammoth paper that I encourage you to go take a look at 
um, with the citation there, which has a lot of the characterization of this thing as a defect in a crystal, right? So instead of looking at a device, it was in a big giant crystal and they were very sparse. And so it was just the, what are the ideal, essentially the, the, the core parameters of this thing? And the answer is that really long lifetimes, we stopped measuring it. These are Han Echo lifetimes. Um, the Dubai wall of factor, which is the proportion of the light that comes out in that really beautiful narrow line. It's about 23%, which is pretty good. The line that's good. So go take a look if you're interested in the defect characteristics. It was an open question at the time, and we hadn't really clicked go on the, on the um, commercialization side because it wasn't clear from just this work if you can make it into devices, if you could do something um, scalable in terms of a technology with it. And so uh, that's what we, we did next, and it worked pretty well. And this is really where uh, the, the company got going um, right around this time. So what we did here is we took that silicon on insulator material, okay, and uh, we implanted the constituents. So what were the constituents for, for this uh, defect are, as I said, carbon and hydrogen. So in this work, we did some of the first uh, implantation work to actually create these things in that SOI material. So we implanted it in, so it's all in the device layer, and then we did a heat treatment so that they formed they formed the T-centers. And what we found is that that core, that material that only has 200 nanometers of silicon at the top, and that's all we implanted into, was substantially brighter than the full crystals that we'd been working with, which were like millimeters in size. And that's because this was different in the sense that we had literally damaged the silicon. Like it was nearly amorphous, but there's so much damage in this thing that um, they formed T centers everywhere. It was really, really bright. And this is really encouraging because it means that you can manufacture this to some level, right? You can put the constituents where they want, you want them to be, and then they form the center. Maybe not with the convert, not with like a perfect conversion um, efficiency, but they can absolutely be made where you want them to be made, which is really encouraging. So what we did is we wanted to demonstrate the ability to put lots of addressable qubits on a chip and actually do that characterization and play with them and initialize them and see those spins um, optically. So what we did is we took that, that really, really bright material, and there's some work where we uh, characterized it in the, in the reference there, but then we etched it and it turns out, again, this is just in some sense, um, mother nature being very fortunate or very generous to us. When you etch that material, the T centers survive. And so what we did is we put the material everywhere, we covered it with T centers and we etched it down into these pucks. And I'm, I'm they're not pillars. You know, people think of these things as, as they in other materials, they say, oh, these are micro pillars. No, these are pucks because they're like flat things and the Canadian in me wants to call them pucks. So we made, we made a whole bunch of pucks and each one of those, which you can see there, each one of them had some small number statistically selected, right? Some small number of T centers within that puck. Now, why would you make pucks? It's because what makes silicon so good for being a integrated photonics platform makes it really bad for outcoupling of light. So what makes it as a good photonics platform is that the light wants to stay in, right? It's a high index material and outcoupling of light is uh, more challenging uh, for, for those reasons, right? So to try and promote some outbound coupling of the light, we etched it into disks so that at least it changed the emission profile, not any Purcell effect, but just the emission profile. And that way we can put a microscope on top of it and take a look. So this is a very standard approach for people that play with color centers, especially like NV centers or, or silicon carbide or the rest. We did it for telecom. And so uh, we borrowed a bit of the uh, pictures here, but um, Daniel here, who's uh, now uh, co-leading the, the group up at, at Simon Fraser with me and, and Mike Thiewald, um, uh led this work alongside Alex um, here, who built out our own cryogenic confocal microscope. And so this is, again, standing on the, uh, the Montana platform, but coming in with our own optics at, at telecom light rated right O-band. Now, um, the reason I just wanted to flag uh, before we get to the last little bit here, uh, we aren't the only ones, but it was really close um, <laughs> in terms of the timing for people to go and find finally other single emitters in silicon for the first time, right? So NV centers are like 20 years old, 25 years old, and nobody had done the work to go and find single emitters in silicon um, and, until that date. So they found them at roughly the same time, G centers in that work and W centers. Um, but we were excited because the T-Center, of course, is the thing that has the spin that kind of unlocks a lot of the processing 
and, and the memory that's needed. But you'll see the kind of coupling efficiencies there on the left. This is just simulation of like how <laughs> uh, this is for like a really good confocal microscope with a high uh, high NA and, you know, the collection efficiency is pretty low. So you still have to be um, in the regime where uh, you're, you're treating all, all the losses very carefully. But with that, we were able to see them and we use this POX framework so that we can actually go and take a clear look at each of them. So what you see on the left there is uh, 144, I think, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, 144, well, at least 144 qubits. So probably 150 qubits in that patch alone. Um, that chip had about 150,000 POX and we were able to go and take a look at single spins. And so this um, ended up being covered in nature, which you're happy about. And what you're able to do is go and take a look with, again, not all at once. We can't talk to, you know, a million qubits all at once or 150,000 qubits all at once. But with that confocal microscope, you can go and talk to each one of them. And importantly, take a look at how that stability looks. Does it blink? Does it bleach? Does it still hang out there, you know, two weeks later? These kinds of uh, the time correlation, the noise spec, like all this stuff you can learn a lot, which you can't see when you're working with a bulk ensemble of these things all at once. So um, for each of those packs, you see those three different colors, you can take a look at the PLE spectra. So the PLE spectra here is where you actually can drive these things resonantly, right? So it's an optical transition that you can, you can hit with a particular wavelength and see luminescence, right? So once you've driven it to that excited state, it'll luminesce. And you can detect that luminescence in a number of different ways, but you can you're you're selecting which one you're driving with your wavelength, and so that's what you're seeing there on the right is for the green puck when you're physically taking a look and collecting those photons. You can see three different or even four different T centers of so those four different peaks in that one puck, and that means that uh, you're going to have a few different orientations, right? They they have different orientations, and they're going to outcouple with different intensities by that by that reason. So each one of those pucks has a different number of T centers. Some of them have none, you know, it's a Poissonian distribution as you'd expect, but you can go and take a look at each one of those things. And really encouragingly, again, mother nature being very generous to us, um, they don't seem to bleach. They don't seem to wander. Um, it was thermally uh, broadened. This is a four Kelvin measurement, which is another bonus, by the way, you don't have to work down at millikelvin for these things to be beautiful qubits. Uh, two Kelvin is kind of where we want to be for the T center in particular because of the excited state. But anyway, um, you can go and take a look at them and they seem very well behaved. They don't seem to jitter around too much. They don't blink or bleach. They just stay where they are. So that's really encouraging. And it was really fun because, um, as I mentioned, Mike Thewell, he, he was a, a co-lead of the, the group. And I kind of when I joined at Simon Fraser, I kind of merged with his group. Our groups merged. And uh, one of the things that he dug up when we started taking a look at T-centers was his old samples from the 90s, the early 90s, where he had look at, uh, looked at a whole bunch of different stuff in silicon. But he found, he remembered that one of the samples had T-centers in it. And we went and remeasured that same sample. And the T-centers were there just nice as strong as before. So these things have longevity to them, which is, which is, which is encouraging. So just because we could, um, we printed a million qubit chip. And uh, because I hadn't really seen that in the in the news to that date, but I would just indicate that you know the what's neat about these things is that the outcoupling is is from the face of the chip. So that once you think about that, and there's different ways of of interfacing these photons. Once it gets out into the the like a fiber in an ideal case, then you can think about connectivity in a very flexible way, right? You're getting the light out of the chip. The chip is meant to like hold on to the quantum information and keep it nice and quiet and cold. But once the photons come out, you can route them however you want. And so for this one, again, you could go and address each one of these individually. The work to be done is how do you address this many simultaneously? And that's a big IO challenge that um, uh, you can imagine I've been thinking about. So in the in the concluding minutes, I'll, I'll just flag uh, two of these papers. They just got accepted to their respective journals. Um, uh, there's a lot more that's uh, being written up at the moment um, to do with the, the basic physics of these things from a from a Simon Fraser University perspective. The first one of these things we went and talked, uh, we went and took a look at how useful are these uh, defects to help with the conversion to telecom photons that is a challenge now being faced by basically other, every other platform. So it seems to be the case that now consensus is slowly emerging that we're going to need to have a way of transducing um, 
information from whatever degree of freedom that is currently supporting high fidelity qubits elsewhere. So if we're talking um, visible light uh, ion traps or superconducting systems or the like, right? A lot of them want ways of mapping their quantum information into telecom, um, uh, a telecom photon, so that they can then use uh, telecom photons to have uh, long, uh, long distance networking as well as high connectivity. And so we went and did the exercise to say, okay, well, how useful would um, these defects be in certain uh, uh, protocols that had already been adapted for uh, that kind of transduction process? And the answer is, it's okay. Um, it's better to work with telecom natively, but if you're interested to go take a look at how those can be used to link together different um, quantum, other quantum hardware platforms, you can go take a look at some of that information. And then the second one is taking a look at waveguide, uh, waveguide integrated T centers. So this is kind of in the direction that I was telling you about is that you can come down and what you're watching is a video of exactly this. You can come down with fibers, um, single mode, like industry standard fibers. And you can position them right on top of the chip and then actually inject light and take a look at the light that comes out and use that to characterize all kinds of stuff, right? Not just your photonic components, but also the qubits and, and on from there. So um, that work uh, was able to take a look at uh, the actually superior performance of, of these defects than um, the first test had indicated. So the first test had taken a look at the optical properties of these defects and came up with some numbers. Um, there's a, not just a T1 time, but also a, an improved characterization of, of that um, optical degree of freedom to, to better facilitate multi-qubit interactions. So that just got accepted, um, but you can go take a look at the archive right there. And then there's more to come. Um, so uh, forthcoming, there'll be a little bit of work on um, uh, electric field tunability and some cavity stuff, and there's, there's more coming. Um, but we're letting that go through the, the manuscript preparation process. And uh, with that, yeah, I'll just say, hey, you know, there's, there's a lot happening. It's, it's moving very fast. And uh, if anything, and, you know, everybody has their own axioms for what they're working on for, for quantum technologies, but these three axioms seem to be working really well. Um, and I would just say if it, as an invitation to um, people attending this, this talk is that there's a lot more opportunity for co-design all the way up and down the stack than I think we realize as a community. So um, there's a lot of open um, opportunities uh, to, to really make progress by working together. So it's just a call for that. And lastly, watch the space. You'll be hearing from us in due course. Um, lots more. Thank you very much for your interest. And I'm open for questions. I gotta tell you, it's a bit weird not hearing claps, <laughs> but I see them, so I appreciate it. Thank you. Is there any questions? So we have um, we have two microphones here. If you have questions, yes, um, come over and walk. Yeah, walk to the front, please. So we have a question here in SFU. Hi. So uh, how does the so so you talked about a lot about how the T center works in the telecom range, and you also talked about how it works as a single photon emitter. How mm -hmm. how can I use the T center as more of a memory as a quantum memory? Is that like you know, like absolutely? Cause... Yeah. So um, you can absolutely basically you want to figure out a way to get those two degrees of freedom entangled with one another. Yeah. And uh, so the spin degree of freedom on its own, right, in the absence of the photon, you can uh, apply a magnetic field and then all the energy levels for all the different spin states for all of those spin qubits that you have in that T-center, they're all, all those transitions are different. So you can selectively drive everything and have full universal control, just kind of like a small scale NMR based quantum processor. Okay, so you can, you can run that um, or EPR based processor. So you have all those, those four qubits that you can have universal control over. Now, when you've applied that magnetic field, the optical degree of freedom is frequency uh, uh, linked to the spin state. So like one, op the actual, you're not just having one um, optical transition, you get multiple depending upon what the initial and the final um, transition is for your optical degree of freedom. So that way you can do, for example, spin selective optical excitation. OK, and if you can do spin selective optical excitation, then you can do all kinds of stuff like setting up spin photon uh, entanglement and uh, and you can take it from there. Right. Um, does that answer your question? 
I was thinking, okay, well, let's say we have the T center as a single photon emitter, and then uh, we do some like you know linear optical quantum computing with beam splitters and uh, phase shifters, and then uh, like you know, okay, like you know, now I need to store the computation into a qubit, and then you're saying, okay, well, if we like you know do the magnetic field in the right way, then we can get like you know we we can do a read in and read out exactly, right? Is that is that is that correct, or um, this is a kind of so there's some um, <laughs> architectural questions to be answered, um, which I'm not going to go into on this recorded talk. There are different ways of thinking about it. You absolutely could do it the way you've described, where you can use the emitter and use this the temporary degree of freedom in the spin state to generate optical cluster states. Totally. You can use the photons and not even the emitted photons. You can even just use reflected photons technically, but you could use the photons to just all they do is project the spins into entangled states, and that's enough too, right? So there's there's lots of different um, ways of combining it, but ultimately all you really need as the as the core component is the ability to entangle a photon with a spin, because um, you know there's different ways of once you do that you can build it together into a larger architecture in many different ways. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other question? Sun Sai, is there any question? Steph, I have a question for you. So you mentioned that um, quantum LDPC code. So can the um, encoding and decoding be done by the POD measurement-based setting, or you need the active um, entanglement gates? Can you say that question again? So the, the quantum LDPC code, yeah. if you want to encode information inside, do you mm -hmm. need a uh, active um, entanglement gates, or you can do it like measurement-based quantum computing setting, you create a big entangled state and then do a measurement and it becomes a quantum LDPC code? Oh, I see. So um, yeah, so LDPC stands for low density parity check, which means that like the, the surface code, the, you have to check the parity, like the whole challenge is, is extracting the parity of a subset of qubits. Now in the surface code, you're extracting the parity from um, nearby qubits, right? So, so just very local ones. For LDPC codes, the, it just says you have to check the parity, but instead of four beside one another, it's four chosen in a distributed way from the, from the broader set, right? So it's qubit 17, 96, 404, right, or whatever. And those form the parity that's checked. Now, as you know, measurement-based and gate-based are equivalent. You can accomplish one and the other. Um, but ultimately, you're going to have to have a way, and those, those mappings aren't... Uh, um, always free, right? So you have to think about what the, the structure is to accomplish the parity check that you want to do. For, yeah. for these frameworks, um, you can imagine photons can get distributed however you want. So so long as you can get the multi-qubit operation um, using those photons, uh, you can com combine that information to achieve the parity check that you want. It doesn't, uh, the, the way, if it's a measurement-based thing where you're doing it with a cluster state, or some other higher dimensional version thereof versus um, uh, just a pure gate-based one. I, like they are equivalent, but you just have to run through the numbers to see which one actually makes the most sense. Um, but they they can both in principle employ a, these, these higher dimensional codes, these higher connectivity okay. codes rather. Okay, thank you. Because ultimately you're just setting the same challenge of do the parity check. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Yep. Yeah, we get there's a mic here. So that's a question for SFU. Uh hello. Um uh I'm not even sure quite how to phrase this question. It's more a thought process. Um, um we talked very briefly via email, but never actually met. Um my name's Sarah Dunsker, I work at Triumph, and where we implant radioactive ions into whatever we like. Um, and so I was interested in your comment about generating the T centers using ion implantation. Could I ask you to comment a little bit more on how you do that, or if there's interest in, in controlling the ion implantation to a greater extent or the species, things like that? Please. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so ion implantation, this is again one of the one of the beauties of standing on the shoulders of giants is that there's actually just implanter services for uh, standard uh, CMOS processing. So um, there's, I don't know, like a dozen that it's, it's kind of funny. There's some of them that are just um, 
like just people that are near retiring that have like an implanter and like their their warehouse garage in, in Silicon Valley and they just do this as a service and they're really good at it. Um, they're all over and uh, fortunately that's all we need for these defects. Okay, so fortunately very standard implantation where there's nothing really fancy needed. They um, they can do that and you can do isotope isotope selective implantation um, with with just those very conventional approaches now. What I'm hoping is that this opens up a broader, and it's starting, um, a broader search uh, in the parameter space that is good color centers in silicon, which would lean more on your uh, the capabilities for uh, that Triumph has and others, right? Where you have like really exotic isotopes that can't really come out of commercial implanters and um, other opportunities there. And because there's just the parameter space for these things is enormous, right? Like there's how many different defects could you possibly make in silicon with different constituents? So I know that people are working at trying to guess what other isotopes might be helpful. Um, but yeah, I think from a, in the short answer, fortunately, um, commercial implantation is, is sufficient for at least the T-Center. So if I could just add a, a follow-up question. Um, uh, could you help me guess, <laughs> or, or or where where would you point us to in terms of a guess for for more exotic implantation? Um, oh, you mean which element? Something like that, or energies, oh. or yeah. yeah so um, there is like literally two weeks ago there was a paper um, out of Berkeley where they started to take a look at through a screening process what single element um, substitutional defects might compete with the T-Center. And literally that's like how it's written in the paper. Um, okay. Now, uh, again, most of these things I find, uh, it's actually kind of better to come at it from the bottom up as well as the top down. So not just take a look from a screening sense in, in silico as it were, like in, in a computational sense, but literally just like start throwing stuff at silicon and see what forms because um, they won't necessarily, uh, it'll be really interesting to see which ones actually form those substitutional centers as opposed to, for example, maybe it's way more efficient for it to form a complex with a, with an oxygen or the rest of it. Like just, do you know what I mean? Like the computational space is so big that it's usually helpful to just kind of have a go and, and see what comes out. And that's what happened with these ones as well. So I think in addition to the, the screening, it would be neat to just take a look, uh, and just start kind of going through the, the periodic table and see what comes out um there, there's more to it than just that but i think there would also be interest in that thank you is there any more question on a zoom side can we take a quick look on the zoom okay if there's no more question let's thanks back again for the amazing talk Okay, well, so the you. final digital seminar will be holding every two, second Tuesday of each month. So the next one will be um, 11th of April and 2 p.m. And again, we will be meeting in this room with coffee and donuts. So please come and have some fun. Thank you very much for coming today. <laughs> Thanks, Steph, again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.